maybe. But if you need us, we'll tear your soul apart. 12 absolutely insane facts about Hellraiser, the original movie. Hellraiser really needs no introduction. Even after almost 33 years since its release, it still remains one of the finest horror films ever. The intriguing plot involves deadly creatures from hell, the Cenobites, a concept that has continuously filled viewers with awe. The film was directed by Clive Barker, who adapted his own novella titled The Hellbound Heart, and with that, one more genius filmmaker was added to the Horror Hall of Fame. You'll do it. Yes. Nobody realized how successful the movie was going to be until it grossed over $14.6 million at the box office, which was several times the budget of the film. A cult following was established, and a franchise followed in no time. Shall we begin? The subsequent Hellraiser films were only pale shadows of the brilliance of the original one, and it didn't take long for the franchise to be relegated to the direct-to-video category. The first Hellraiser movie is an absolute classic, and even after all these years, it could still give a modern horror flick a run for its money. Pain has a face. Allow me to show it to you. In this video, we have a treat in store for the Hellraiser fans. We will provide you with some shocking facts about the movie that you have probably never heard of before. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. The Cenobite's design was inspired by SM clubs. Hellraiser is famously known for introducing one of the most iconic horror villains ever, Pinhead. I am pain. The idea behind Pinhead and the other Cenobites was a masterstroke by Clive Barker, and he used inspiration from all over the world to design these characters. It was important that the Cenobites, especially Pinhead, had instantly recognizable and distinct features. The end results, sure as anything, ensured that the deadly Cenobites would be feared and remembered for all time. The 80s were famous for giving us some of the deadliest horror villains, but most of them were either silent, maniacal killers, or gruesome monsters. Barker, however, dared to deviate from the norm, creating a cunning and articulate character who could send shivers down your spine. For once, we had a horror villain who was more dignified than others, and he took the form of a sadomasochistic torturer, deriving pleasure from the punishment of his victims. One of the first things that inspired Barker to design the Cenobites was his discovery of African fetish sculptures. Once the design team finalized the look of the Cenobites, Pinhead had a definite edge with his hellish appearance. You have surely noticed a kinky touch that was given to the Cenobites. Everything from their leather outfits to their love of pain and pleasure screams sadomasochism. You solved the box. We came. Now you must come with us. Taste our pleasures. Barker's visit to various SM clubs in New York and Amsterdam gave him the idea to introduce this angle in his work. We must also keep in mind that Barker was heavily inspired by Marquis de Sade, who is known for his experimentation with erotica and sexual debauchery. Something completely out of the box was required to create a movie so unique, and Barker's inspirations were clearly varied and downright weird. You're here to change all that, aren't you? Hellraiser vs. Halloween movies almost happened. We all left to see two mighty monsters in a fierce battle, and Hollywood never disappoints with that stuff. Be it a Freddy Krueger vs. Jason Voorhees, or Godzilla vs. King Kong, the idea of pitting two heavyweights against one another is always exciting. But did you know that there was almost a crossover between the Hellraiser and Halloween franchises? Yes, you heard right. Pinhead was to take on the notorious Michael Myers in what could have been a mouth-watering contest. We want the man who did this. However, we can't help but wonder how Michael Myers would ever manage to get the better of Pinhead. The guy has the entire force of hell backing him up, and Michael Myers is barely even supernatural. A dreaded serial killer would surely be no match for the leader of the Cenobites, and Pinhead would probably put him through a world of pain. I am the way. 
We are also curious to know how a screenwriter planned to put the two together in a story. Dimension Films was curious to try it out, but they were skeptical about what the audience response would be to Freddy vs. Jason in 2003. When it proved to be a huge hit, they started reconsidering the idea and even spoke to actor Doug Bradley. Doug got Clive Barker on board and he was even willing to write a script featuring the two baddies. What was more enticing for horror fans was the rumor that John Carpenter might sign on as the director. Alas, the idea never moved beyond the development stage because the Halloween producers were not too keen on such a movie. Now we could still guess the possible outcomes of this fascinating contest. Doug Bradley didn't want to play Pinhead. One of the biggest reasons for the phenomenal success of Hellraiser was Doug Bradley, who owned the role of Pinhead. It is desire. But believe it or not, he initially wasn't keen to play the role that would eventually make him a horror icon. In fact, Clive Barker offered him a choice of two different roles at first. While both these roles had limited screen time, one was Pinhead and the other was the mover who helps Larry Cotton move a mattress up the stairs. Doug Bradley was a fresh face back then and he was concerned that all the makeup that went into putting together Pinhead would conceal his identity as an actor and people wouldn't recognize him. Some stories suggest that Bradley ultimately decided to play the role of Pinhead, but there are some versions that say that he lost out to Oliver Parker, who was selected for the role of the moving man. Isn't it awesome when a comedy of errors leads to the perfect result? The way Bradley brought an evil and confident air to Pinhead, we really doubt any other actor would have been able to fill the shoes. I remember. He went on to reprise the role seven more times, and while he has done a lot of other work in his career, he is still hailed most of all for his work as the lead Cenobite. Now, to think that he almost backed out of the role because of the arduous makeup is just amusing, because it is the part that made him a legend. Oh my god. Get out. The movie had a maggot wrangler and a roach wrangler. You are probably aware that when Hollywood movies use some kind of animals, there is usually a wrangler to handle the creatures. In this case, there was a maggot wrangler and a roach wrangler on set. Ashley Lawrence, who played the role of Kirsty Cotton in the movie, had some disturbing scenes to pull off. She had to look rugged, filthy, and sweaty, and for that, she wore the same t-shirt all through the shoot. It was a requirement of the script because if one is fighting off demons from hell, one can't possibly look rosy. While filming the scenes with maggots, Clive Barker actually tossed a few down Lawrence's cleavage. Ashley was sprayed before the shot to look sweaty, and a few of these maggots actually got stuck inside her bra. A maggot wrangler was there to handle the scene, but the only comfort for Lawrence was the maggots wouldn't hurt someone who was alive. There was a roach handler as well who had to determine the sex of the cockroaches being used because British law didn't permit both genders of cockroach being put together lest it should lead to an infestation. It must have been quite a job to wrangle cockroaches roaches and identify their genders. In an era of CGI, such a scene would have been pulled off with no effort in an AC room. The only problem is that the movie would never become a classic like Hellraiser. How dare you! Thou shalt not bow down before any graven image. The origins of Pinhead came from a 1973 play. There has been much debate regarding the origin of Pinhead, but few are aware that these can be traced back to 1973 when Clive Barker directed a play titled Hunters in the Snow. Doug Bradley was also a part of the play, and his role was that of a Dutchman, who was an undead inquisitor and torturer. Bradley has described his character as rather strange, someone who had an empty head but still managed to convey everything. This was the brief outline of a character who was eventually to become the pinhead we know and love. No more games. <laughs> you could say that the movie version was an updated version of this character from the play. Another crucial influence was the nail board that Barker had built for his story titled The Forbidden. This was a wooden block that had six inch nails banged into it at the intersections of the squares. Sounds familiar? Well, that's because Pinhead's skull is exactly like that, just with a human face added over the structure. It is remarkable how something trivial can develop into a genre-defining idea in just a few years. Did you like this? 
Erotic scenes were cut. The subtle sexual innuendos in the direct erotic scenes are hard to miss in the movie. However, few are aware that some of the hotter scenes were cut because they were considered a bit too much for the masses. While the film had shed inhibitions with the makeout scenes with skinless people or with its abundant sadomasochism, there are a few moments that were simply too outrageous for a movie of that time. For starters, Frank and Julia were supposed to indulge in a sexually explicit encounter, but the actors refused. They weren't comfortable with the extreme sodomy, and although Barker's vision was clear and exact, some bits were just not meant to be. I'll do anything you want. There was also a rather kinky sequence that involved some spanking, but the Motion Pictures Association of America was not happy to approve something so out of the ordinary. One of Julia's murder victims insisted on being naked for the scene, but the makers had to put some clothes on him because of the sharp glare of the censorship board. Get out of here! Overall, a lot of sexual content was toned down for the commercial release. Some of these scenes were shot, while others died as ideas. God knows where all this lost footage is today. We came. It's just a bottle run! Oh no. It is a means to summon us. Barker's grandfather inspired the puzzle box. The key to summoning the Cenobites from Hell was the Lament Configuration Puzzle Box, so you can certainly understand the importance of this object in the film. It is shown that whenever a person solves the puzzle, he ends up summoning these demonic creatures. You want it? Give me the box! You want it? Fucking have it! Hundreds of other cheap slasher flicks had used rituals to summon demons, with the characters drawing circles on the floor with the satanic symbols all around. Clive Barker wanted something different for his story. Wait. The idea came to him quite unexpectedly, from something brought home by his grandfather. Barker's grandfather worked as a cook on a ship and brought a strange puzzle box from the far east after one of his voyages. The mysterious puzzle box interested Barker, who immediately had an idea of using it as a tool to open the doors of hell. It was a smart and innovative idea because people all over the world could relate to such puzzles. They exist in all cultures and the mystery associated with them makes things all the more convenient for people to believe. All we can say is that the idea worked fine and went on to be used frequently thereafter. This is the hell you have created for yourself. Pinhead would have cameoed in the Freddy vs. Jason movie. We have already told you how there was a plan for a crossover movie in which Pinhead would face Michael Myers. Even before that, the slasher crossover Freddy vs. Jason was supposed to star Pinhead in a small cameo. Two iconic horror villains battled it out in this film, and while the critics didn't have good things to say, the fans loved it. The project, however, took years to materialize after a number of scripts and concepts were canceled. Eventually, the work of Damian Shannon and Mark Swift was given the go-ahead, even though this wasn't their first idea. The duo had penned a few other endings that weren't approved. Some of these were even shot, but edited out of the final cut. Welcome to hell. The scene with Pinhead, however, never moved past the planning stage. It was thought that during the final showdown between Jason and Freddy at Crystal Lake, the two should be sucked back to hell. Their fight would continue even in hell, but Pinhead would interrupt them, prompting questions of a possible sequel. This was obviously meant to be a very short appearance, but would still feature Pinhead in his complete gear along with hooked chains. The idea was chucked out because it would have been a problem to get the rights for Pinhead from Dimension Films and New Line Cinema wasn't quite up for the challenge. What a sight it would have been though, the trio of horror legends sharing the screen. The original title was much more disturbing. If you knew the title that Clive Barker had in mind for this movie, you would probably think Hellraiser sounded like a cute kindergarten song. As many of you know, this film was based on Barker's novella titled The Hellbound Heart. Initially, he wanted this as the title, but the studio found it to be foolishly romantic. Barker was not one to be demoralized by rejection, and instead he suggested the title Sadomasochists from Beyond the Grave. Just imagine a movie released with such a title. Sadly, the studio once again stepped in and thought that Barker's creative liberty had been taken too far. 
they settled on the name Hellraiser because it was so much easier to market a movie with such a title. Being short and snappy, it would ring a bell with the audiences who wouldn't mind a vicious title given the creepy story. On a lighter note, Hellraiser could have ended up with a rather sexy title as well because one of the women on set suggested the name What a Woman Will Do for a Good. Well, given the terrible titles that followed in the sequels, these alternative ones might not have been the worst of ideas. Explorers in the further regions of experience, demons to some, angels to others. The levitation scene was done using a glorified seesaw. Necessity is the mother of invention, and the film Hellraiser proved this several times during production. For example, the levitation scene which sees Pinhead rise above Christie was done using a teeter board, which is basically a glorified seesaw. Doug Bradley was made to stand on one end and assistant director Selwyn Roberts stood on the other end. He was a big guy and his weight counterbalanced the contraption perfectly, ensuring that Pinhead gradually rose upwards. There was plenty of other movements where such innovations came in handy. The cast faced some scary ordeals, such as one where Frank was hung upside down for a scene. They ran out of money and had to do some VFX at the last minute. With a budget of around $1 million, it would be unfair to say that Hellraiser was a low budget production, but nevertheless, they did run out of money. This became such a big problem that some VFX had to be done at the last minute. Do you remember one of the final scenes with the pterodactyl type demon that flew away with the puzzle box? This was the work of an FX guy named Bob Keane who was keen to work for just 700 pounds. The result was something that hardly looked very extravagant. The crude appearance should be blamed on those funding the film. It wasn't until much later that the backers realized that they had a gem of a movie on their hands. Till then, the production struggled to film a few scenes, and even once the backers agreed to fund more, there had to be a compromise. Barker, for instance, had to change the settings to the US simply for marketing purposes. Some of the voices had to be dubbed by American actors, something that Barker wouldn't have imagined in his wildest dreams. Before they received the extra funding, they had to make do with short cuts, such as mimicking a shot of a burning house by shooting a burned photograph. Hellraiser is a classic example of how determination can see a project through no matter what the obstacles might be. No more delays, Kirsty. No more teasing. Time to play. Time to play. Nintendo tried to develop a game. When there is a gripping plot in place, games turn to movies and vice versa in a jiffy. Haven't you ever wondered how we never really had a game version of such an amazing movie? Someone did try to make it happen. During the 1990s, a game was being developed by Color Dreams for the NES console. The game was supposed to be lightly based on the Hellraiser themes and would see its protagonist trapped in a puzzle box. The objective of this game was to get away from the Cenobites and find a way to escape the hellish world. The developers were unwilling to pay a fee to Nintendo for the evaluation of the game and eventually it was scrapped. But would the game have been any good? While there is no way to know, we do doubt the credentials of Color Dreams. They were known for developing unlicensed products that ended up being of questionable quality. The plotline was hardly intriguing, and it could well have turned out to be an average take on an extraordinary world. Anyways, like we said, there is no way of knowing now, and all we could do is speculate. We thought we'd lost you. So sweet of you to come back. How can it send us back, child? We're already here, and so are you. Conclusion the Hellraiser franchise has been on a downward spiral ever since the first couple of movies. Many fans believe that Clive Barker's absence is what has ruined the series, but the recent news of Barker reclaiming the rights to Hellraiser has instilled hope. Barker used the same old US copyright law that allows the writer to regain the rights to a work unless he was writing for hire. Wait. No more deals, Kirsty. While he did obtain the rights in the US, he would still have to strike a deal with a few international companies before he could go about seeking worldwide distribution for any new projects. However, it is safe to say that he faces no real threat because nobody would try a Hellraiser reboot that could not be released in the US. The Hellraiser movie and TV show to be aired on HBO are already in the making, and these projects are set to roll out as expected. So much flesh, so many different pleasures. Barker is an executive producer on the show, and it is unlikely that he would stall the project. 
As for the film, when we last heard, David Bruckner was set to direct it and the script was being written by the same guys who wrote The Nye House. As of now, no release date is known and we are awaiting these two projects with a lot of hope and enthusiasm. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.